I think there are two main problems concerned with diagnosis for patients with um, homocystinuria um, or the different forms of homocystinuria. Um, and I think these are first a problem of awareness and people thinking of the correct test to be done. Um, and um, unfortunately, these are rare diseases that can present in a very disparate um, uh, manner um, to many different specialties. Um, and consequently, um, people don't immediately think of this diagnosis when these patients present. And unfortunately, that means that there is often a significant delay in diagnosis, which then means that damage has been done and that the treatment in due course is less effective. Um, indeed, some damage is done even prior to patients developing symptoms, but certainly um, there is then this frustrating delay in diagnosis. So I feel that greater awareness of these conditions among the specialties that manage them um, would certainly help in terms of making the diagnoses. Once people suspect the diagnosis, then testing the total homocysteine will pick these patients up. But there is the problem in people being aware of the conditions and then thinking of doing the tests. So that is the first problem, is awareness um, uh, within the uh, specialties to whom these patients present. Um, and because of that, I feel that we really do need to try and find a way of diagnosing these patients earlier, independent of them having to present to patients. And that is where the second unmet need comes in, because um, uh, to get round this problem that I've mentioned, I think the only way is to try and diagnose these patients by means of universal screening. Um, and um, that would then not only get round the problem of delay in people thinking of doing the test, but also the problem of damage having been done even by the time that the first symptoms made themselves appear. Um, uh, and so um, newborn screening can get round those problems, but there are problems with newborn screening. Firstly, there are a limited number of countries in which newborn screening is done. And secondly, unfortunately, with the current techniques of newborn screening, um, we cannot pick up all of these cases. So for patients with um, uh, classical homocystinuria, CBS deficiency, um, uh, we know that patients who respond to pyridoxine tend not to have um, significantly raised methionine levels that would mean that they would be picked up with screening techniques based on raised methionine levels. And indeed, even a number of patients who do not respond to pyridoxine do not have methionine levels above the cutoff that would be used. And so um, the, the current techniques used for newborn screening for CBS deficiency are missing patients. Um, uh, and then um, for um, uh, the remethylation defects, one depends upon picking up low methionine levels and the sensitivity and specificity of this technique are generally insufficient for countries to use that as a screening technique. And so in my country, in the UK, we now look for um, CBS deficiency, looking for high methionine levels, but we certainly are not looking for low methionine levels to pick up um, remethylation defects. So those are the problems I see with diagnosis of homocystinuria. Unfortunately, there are a lot of unmet needs in the treatment of the various forms of homocystinuria. And this problem is most acute for the patients with homocystinuria due to remethylation defects. That's things like um, cobalamin C disease 
and MTHFR deficiency. And for these patients, our treatment is extremely unsatisfactory. Um, we can manage some of the problems. So for patients with cobalamin C deficiency, they can get a multi-system disorder. Um, and we can prevent things like the kidney problems, the hemolytic uremic syndrome. We can prevent things like the hematological disturbances and the lung disease. But um, our treatment is much less satisfactory for the brain disease and for the eye disease. Um, and we are not yet sure why we can't treat these with our current techniques, which are basically um, uh, to give large amounts of vitamin B12 and to use betaine. Um, uh, but those techniques are not preventing um, uh, these um, uh, current problems with the brain and the eye. Um, and then for um, uh, uh, classical homocystinuria, our treatment works. Um, but our treatment is extremely difficult. So some patients respond to pyridoxine, and that is a relatively straightforward treatment. People just need to remember to take their drug. Um, uh, but um, for other patients, um, uh, uh, they need to go on to a very difficult diet. Um, and that diet um, is very tricky during childhood, but parents often manage it. Um, but as the patients get older, um, uh, uh, as they become adolescents and young adults, their compliance with this difficult diet will often deteriorate. Um, and um, uh, uh, the um, uh, deterioration and the high levels of homocysteine can then have catastrophic effects. People can have um, uh, thromboses and embolic disease, um, which can um, be fatal um, or lead to um, sometimes strokes and profound handicap. And so if we had a form of treatment that was easier, then compliance one would help would be better at this time and these catastrophes could be averted. Um, the other unmet need with treatment um, is that we are not certain of the answers for certain aspects of treatment. So um, for cobalamin C disease, if we take that example, we don't know what is the optimal dose of, of vitamin B12. We know that it probably has to be given by injections, which unfortunately are painful, um, but we don't know how often those injections have to be given in order to maximize the benefit. Do they have to be given every day or is once a week sufficient? And when it's so painful, one doesn't want to give more treatment than is necessary. Um, and then for um, uh, classical homocysteinuria, we don't know what the target homocysteine levels should be. Do we need to be keeping um, total homocysteine levels below 120? Do we need to be keeping them below 100? Do we need to be keeping them below 80 in order to maximize the benefit? And so these uncertainties are further compounding the problems we have relating to treatment. There are, of course, other unmet needs in addition to these. And because of these, um, problems that I've already raised. So, um, uh, because our treatment is unsatisfactory, um, our patients unfortunately have problems. Um, they have behaviour problems, they have learning difficulties, um, uh, they have visual problems, um, and all of these add to the burden of um, our um, families and um, mean that they have other unmet needs. And we aren't sometimes addressing the things that really make the greatest difficulties for our families, um, the things that affect their quality of life. And so it would be very helpful if we had tools to assess quality of life and we could then look to make sure that the things we did for our families really did maximise the quality of life and making sure that uh, they were being effective. So that is one unmet need, a tool to assess quality of life. 
Another is to improve the information for these families because often uncertainties and lack of understanding in the families again worsens the problem and this is something that could more easily be addressed to be honest than um, improving screening for the remethylation defects or improving treatment for the remethylation defects and so um, improved um, uh, information is something that we have been trying to provide as part of the EHOD project funded by the European Union um, uh, and there are still ways in which we could improve this information but it's something that we've been trying to address.